Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. True or false? True. True to some people, for sure. Others would say, maybe. And then others would just say, false. This is not the most wonderful time of the year. Some people might say that Christmas is the darkest time of the year. The time when they feel most lonely. The time they feel most afraid. Christmas, for some people, is the most wonderful time of the year, but for others, it's just a season of darkness that they've got to get through year after year after year. Christmas brings out all of our emotions. And it brings out some of the best emotions, but it also brings out some of the ones that we tend to suppress at other times. During this Advent season, we are going to be connecting the Christmas story with the movie Inside Out. I love the movie Inside Out because it lifts up various emotions that you and I have and says they all work together. How many of you have seen the movie Inside Out? Wow, okay, awesome, a good number of you have. The movie is about Riley, who is an 11-year-old child, and she's moving from Minnesota to San Francisco. And the story shows what happens in her mind with her emotions as she goes through a major life change. There's five main characters that are the emotions that are in her head. So watch this video, which will introduce the five emotions, and I want you to get to know them today and throughout this, this worship series. As the parent of a two-year-old, I see disgust and anger working in his mind often. But I love this movie because it lifts up these emotions and says it's normal to have fear and sadness and disgust. And they work together to ultimately bring about joy. But we need each of these emotions. And it says that these are normal to feel as human beings. And what I love about the movie is that it acknowledges them, but I love that about our scriptures as well. Sometimes in the church, we we have a tendency to put on facades. We say, oh, I've got Jesus in my heart, so it's full of joy. I'm I'm not really sad, I'm not really angry, I'm not really scared because I've got Jesus and everything's okay. And that's not the reality. And that's not the reality scripture paints for us. As we read through scriptures, we see that some of the characters in the story, some of God's people who fully loved God, experienced sadness, and they experienced anger, and disgust, and even fear. These were people who fully loved God, but they could acknowledge their emotions. And ultimately, those emotions worked together to bring about a certain joy that we do find in Christ. So over Advent, we're going to be combining inside out and some of those emotions with the Christmas story. I want to look at Zechariah today. We're going to look at sadness because Zechariah has a story of sitting with sadness and then moving to a place of hope. Zechariah was a priest, and he was a pretty old priest, in fact, and, and his wife's name was Elizabeth. We're going to be looking at, the, at Luke chapter 1 this morning and, and the story of, of Zechariah. And he, he goes into the temple to, to offer an instant sacrifice. And, and as he's there, imagine this old man walking in. And this angel appears to him, frightens him, and says, Zechariah, you're going to have a son. And he's going to be a prophet and he's going to pave the way for the Messiah. He's speaking about John the Baptist. And, and as Gabriel tells this to Zechariah, this old man who's wanted a child for decades and is now past the age to really have a child, the angel speaks to him and, and listen to what Zechariah says in, in chapter one, verse 18 of the Gospel of Luke. Zechariah said to the angel, how will I know that this is so? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. That's a nice way to say she's really old also. (laughs) The, The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, 
and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak, until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. I imagine that Zechariah felt pretty sad. Imagine waiting decades and decades to have a child and all of a sudden he is so excited to go tell the world, to go tell his wife that they're going to have a baby. But he can't speak. I think back to the times when, when Aaron and I knew we were pregnant and we spent hours just talking about our hopes for our children, talking about the future, talking about what each child would become. I remember talking to her belly so my kids could hear me. Zachariah, who has waited patiently for a child, can't speak, can't share in that joy. I imagine he's sitting in silence. For nine months, he sits and he waits for this child to be born. And so I want to leave Zachariah sitting there in silence, sitting in sadness. And we're going to leave him there for a little bit, and we're going to look at the movie Inside Out again. So we're coming up on a clip from Inside Out where one of the characters, Bing Bong, has this, this encounter with sadness. Bing Bong's one of my favorite characters in the movie. He, he is Riley's imaginary friend from when she was four years old. And he's kind of wandering in the back of her memory banks and her long-term memory, is, as, as, and he's waiting to be recalled to, to become Riley's best friend again. But she's 11. But he wants to desperately be her friend again to go on the adventures, and they have this little red wagon that they would fly around in, that they would travel and they would go on adventures. And Bing Bong is kind of wandering around in Riley's memory, and, and they're in Imagination Land. And, and Imagination Land is the place where Riley stores all these fun and, and goofball-type memories. But next to this Imagination Land is this big pit, and it's called the Memory Dump. Once things are pushed to the Memory Dump, they are gone forever. So in her brain, when her brain decides they don't need this memory anymore, it's pushed to the pit, the dump. Some of y'all know what dump I'm talking about because you feel like you, all of your memories are going to that dump often. <laughs> so watch this clip as sadness and joy and bing bong interact. So bing bong sits with sadness and then is able to move to a place of hope. Did you see Joy's role in the film? Bing Bong is sitting there and has just watched everything Bing Bong hopes for and longs for be destroyed. And Joy cannot move him forward. Have you seen somebody like that? Have you been around somebody like that? When, when, when you're going through a tough situation, they're the ones that are well-meaning, but they come and say, oh, oh we, we, we can fix this. Or everything's going to be all right if we just do this. And we don't always need that, do we? Sometimes we need to be like Bing Bong and sit with sadness. And so when Bing Bong, which it's weird to say Bing Bong over and over again in a sermon. Let, let's just acknowledge that. But when Bing Bong is sitting there with sadness. They acknowledge that all of their hopes and dreams have changed. That the future is not going to be what they thought it would be. That the reality is full of sadness. And there's pain and there's loss. But in acknowledging that, Bing Bong is able to then move forward to then look at a new future, to get up 
and to take steps into a new direction. Bing Bong sits with sadness and finds himself moving towards hope. And I think that's where we find Zachariah. Zachariah sits with sadness for nine months and dealing with the reality, is this really gonna happen? Is God really gonna do what God says God's gonna do? And I'm sure in those nine months, Zachariah thinks about all the times they tried to have a child and it didn't work, the tears that they cried, and and Zachariah feels his own personal sadness. But then as a priest, I imagine in the midst of, of this silence of nine months, he has kind of a spiritual time out, if you will. He can't go about doing the things he was normally doing and, and, and so it causes him to kind of push distractions aside, to spend a little extra time with God. And I imagine as he read the scriptures, what we'd, we'd call the Old Testament, he's reading in there and it talks about God bringing about freedom. God bringing them out of oppression. God bringing about justice and peace. I imagine as Zechariah reads about peace and justice and freedom from oppression, he's reminded of their current reality. That Zechariah and, and the, the Israelites are living in a time where they feel God has been silent for hundreds of years. They feel like God really hasn't done much for them. They're wondering if God's ever going to do something again. Scripture says that they're going to be free from their oppressors, but they're living in a world that is occupied by the Romans who are pressing down on them. Zechariah acknowledges the sadness, not just for himself, but the sadness of the reality of all of his people. And he sits in that sadness for nine months. But in doing that, I think he starts getting glimpses of hope, of acknowledging that there is pain, but that maybe God's gonna do something new. He's got nine months to think about this. And then the child is born. And they're at the naming ceremony and Zachariah still can't speak. And Elizabeth says his name will be John. And everybody in the room says, you can't name him John. That's not a family name. And then Zachariah starts motioning for a tablet to be brought over. And he writes the words, his name is John. And in doing that, he's now able to speak. Zachariah has sadness mixed up and and now he could speak. And now he starts proclaiming hope. And he goes into this song in in Luke chapter one of proclaiming salvation to people. To all these people, God is taking their sadness and moving it to hope and to joy. And he proclaims this and, and salvation is not just from a personal standpoint of salvation from sins, but salvation for all the people, freedom from oppression, freedom from sins, salvation in the most holistic sense Zechariah proclaims this and says, this little baby is going to help pave the way for the Christ child. And if you look in in Luke chapter 1, we're going to read a couple verses from that. Verses 76 through 79. I imagine Zechariah then picks up his son, the son he's been waiting for, praying for for decades. He lifts the child up. Kind of like imagine the Lion King and Simba, you know, hum, right? And so I I imagine him picking up this little boy and saying, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare a way to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to those who are in the darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Can you imagine? 
Zachariah has waited nine months It's sadness, and now he's holding this child that represents hope and salvation for all people. Zechariah only gets to that point of proclaiming hope because he sits with sadness. So I wonder if you and I need to sit with sadness for a little bit. Maybe not all of us in here, and and maybe not all to the same extent, but I wonder if some of us, as we approach Christmas, might find it healthy to do what Zachariah did, might find it healthy to do what Bingbog did, and to sit with sadness. So maybe for some people in here that's simply acknowledging that Christmas isn't the most wonderful time of the year. And maybe it's, it's doing some work of thinking why Christmas doesn't get you excited. And maybe in doing that you'll say, yeah, Christmas, it was that time of year when my parents told me 30 years ago that they were getting divorced. And Christmas has never been the same since that point. Or maybe as you approach Christmas, you know that somebody you love is no longer with you. And what was Christmas, what was the normal tradition of Christmas that centered around this one person is is no longer a reality, no longer ever a possibility. And because that reality has changed, we kind of sit in a place of sadness. Sometimes sitting with sadness means acknowledging things are different and acknowledging that there's some pain. But as you're sitting in sadness, as you're sitting in darkness, you don't have to do that alone. And I think you know you don't have to do that alone because you came to church today. You chose not to stay in your warm, dry house, but you ventured out to enter into a community of people who are doing life with you. And we know a number of people in here are feeling sad but there are a number of people in here that will walk with you through that sadness. A new ministry kicks off today called Where to Turn. And if you have have ever been in a spot or if you're sitting in a spot right now and saying, I am facing cancer. I am facing my child dealing with an addiction. And, And I just want to talk to somebody who's been at that same spot. Somebody who's gone through this before. We have people in our church, part of the Where to Turn ministry, who are there to say, yeah, I've been there, and I've experienced that sadness, but there's hope on the other side. We have Stephen ministers who will walk with you. If this process might take longer than a couple weeks, they'll walk with you for weeks and months and years, and just be a voice of encouragement, somebody to listen to you as you sit with sadness. And some of you in here might need this, or maybe you know somebody who needs it, but on on December 14th, we're going to have a blue Christmas service. And this is a new thing for our church, but a blue Christmas service is a time to celebrate Christmas, but also to lift up the fact that we are experiencing grief or pain, and to remember some loved ones we've lost this year or in years past. Maybe you need it, or maybe you've got a friend that you could tell about it. But as you sit in darkness, as you sit in sadness, you don't have to do it alone. So this Advent season, you do have permission to sit with sadness. And it might be just the Advent season. You might be like Zachariah where it's nine months of sitting with sadness. And as you sit, you might discern, is this depression or is this sadness? Because those can be, those are two drastically different things. And if you're experiencing depression, our church is here to help you as well. But as you sit in this sadness, sit with sadness, know that it takes work, right? We don't just sit there and and mope, but we have to acknowledge that something is wrong. We acknowledge it, we experience it, we deal with it. Because sometimes if we're carrying the sadness to the Christmas season, it's easier 
to just eat a little more or to drink a little more and we get through the season. But the tough thing is Christmas comes year after year after year. So if you find yourself experiencing sadness year after year after year during this time, sit with the sadness. Because God in the silence of nine months did preparatory work in Zechariah to move him from a place of sadness to hope. And God in the centuries of silence did preparatory work in the people of Israel to move them from a place of sadness to hope. And so my prayer for you this year is that God will do some work in your life as you sit in sadness and then God will help move you to a place of hope. Let's pray. Holy God, you are always at work within us. And God, you give us people to surround us in those times when life is difficult, in those times when we really just don't wanna move forward. You have given us a community, and most of all, you've given us your son to provide hope for us. And so God, for those in here that need to do some work this season, to need, that need to sit in silence, to sit in sadness, God, I pray that you wrap your loving arms around them. Provide the peace that only you can provide. And God, ultimately lead us all to a place of hope. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.